Okay, before we get to the Corios occurrences, I just want to show you. This is the Huia, the, you know, Hohuias Tuantropu. If you just search on Tuantropu, like I'm doing here in Bible Works 9, you see the occurrences. That's how come I know what they are. It's real easy to search in Bible Works. The last time you got a Parousia reference is right here. In Matthew 24 39. The last occurrence in Matthew 24 of Hohuias to Anthropu is right here at Matthew 24 44, which I haven't covered yet. But it's always distance, the distance in the syllable counts is always divisible by seven when you're starting at the beginning of the phrase or the ending of the phrase, depending on how they want, you know, how, how it's supposed to measure. Sometimes it's between, sometimes it's inclusive of the last phrase, uh, sometimes it's inclusive of the last phrase and the prior phrase. And it's always a book ending of history about missionary activity, Bible appearance, Bible translation appearance, uh, that sort of thing. And then the last occurrence is in Matthew 25 31, which is almost at the end of the chapter. And that's a future reference. I don't know what kind of Bible appearance it's talking about there. Okay, if I were closer in history to that event, I would know. But I don't. Okay, but I do know the character of it because of the, all these past occurrences that you see in Matthew 24 beginning at verse 27. Because these are past to us. Okay, it's Matthew 25, 10 through 12. That's our period now. This is ahead of us, and I don't know exactly what it's going to be, but whoever's going to be alive then hopefully will know, because certainly this meter is supposed to be discovered now. Because why would I know it if it's not supposed to be known? Because I'm not smart enough to invent these kinds of connections. And again, the distance between each, each occurrence is divisible by seven, sometimes inclusive of the phrase, sometimes exclusive of the phrase. Okay, and the same thing is true in Luke, and in Luke, in our passage that we're looking at, is right here in verse 27, which we've already covered, and verse 36, which is the end of the chapter. So those things are important as far as the hohuyo to anthropu thing, and hohuyas to anthropu, in those chapters that have to do with, you know, the prophetic meaning of it appearance of God to you the real one not the fake one because that's where we're going to come into with the Koryas verses is it's going to include now the fake one and where did I put that which tab do I have that search right here okay so we start looking here and in Matthew the first occurrence of the use of the word kurios at all is in Matthew 24 42 and that matters a bunch because in Matthew 24 42 you'll see that that's just after see here's parousia when parousia stops being used this is real important kurios replaces it and how do you know that because the distance is divisible by seven between this phrase and every occurrence of Koryas. Every occurrence of Koryas, every time it appears in the text, the distance is divisible by seven. Luke does not use the term. See, here's all the search for Koryas in Matthew and Luke. And in Luke 21, which is the text we're comparing, there is no appearance of the word Koryas in the, in the Luke text for for chapter 21. You got it in chapter 20 and then it's next appears in chapter 22. So it's not in Luke 21 which is paralleling Matthew 24. It is however frequently in Matthew 24 and 25 and the first time it occurs is at a seven distance from Parousia Clause right here. So it's synonymal to it, which of course it should be because this is the Lord and this is about the appearance of the Son of Man and that's another nickname for him. Okay, here's the question. This is where it gets into our present with the Donald Trump thing. Lord. The word means Lord like in Master, 
human master. Or it means Lord like in God. It's used both ways, both in the Greek and in, and in you know, um, custom. Outside the Bible. So this is the, the irony and the wit and the satire that Matthew's, you know, starting to post here in verse 42, which has to do with the period of 1386 A.D. to 1410. And what's so important about this phrase in its usage here is what years that word kurios represents that will tell us how is it synonymal to parousia? Well, we know what parousia means. It has to do with missionary activity, the appearance of Bible, uh, Bible coming to you and you didn't even know it existed, learning about the Lord and you didn't even know who he was. And now it's just more brief. It's just a key word rather than a whole anaphoric phrase. But it's still got the concept of him coming, see, because that's erketai. He will come. Okay, the Lord comes. So who is this? Now this is where it really gets really interesting and relates so much to our day now and relates so much to the English Reformation. This phrase here is standing for 1401, 02, and 03, depending on what fiscal year you want to talk about. What was that? That was the period of Wycliffe and Jan Hus. Jan Hus discovered Wycliffe's writings. Jan Hus translated the Bible into Czech. And you'll remember way back up here, Parousia, the first occurrence of Parousia, this was the conversion of Moravia. Moravia and the Czechs and the Poles are all related to each other. Okay, so here we have a continuation of the same theme, but now using a new keyword, Kurias. And it's two syllables because it's Hebraistically pronounced Kuryas, okay, instead of Kurios, which will be the classical Greek that Luke will use. Well, Luke doesn't even use the term in, in Luke 21. So, Kurios, because, because the Jews th will take a Y-O or a Y-A, uh, I-O or an I-A and say Yo or Ya. Because they're thinking like Hebrew, okay? Yahweh. I mean, it's too common. It's too basic. So they're not going to say Kuriyas. They're going to say Kuriyas. And that's a that's a, a pronunciation I think that's unique to Matthew, because the Paul uses it as three syllables, and so does Luke. But Paul, but Matthew uses Hebraistic pronunciation throughout, which he sets up in Matthew 1 with all those names. So that's why I feel comfortable doing this. This is 14, 1401 or 1402, 03, 04, 1401, 1401 or 2 or 3, depending on what fiscal you want to count. That is Wycliffe and Jan Hus. Those are reformers. Okay? And you say, well, how do you know that it's really them? Well, because the next time it occurs, see, here with the definite article, well, here with the definite article, it's three syllables including the article. Here, the next time it occurs, this is standing for Zwingli and Erasmus and Luther. See, because you have to add 30 to the to syllable counts. So that's standing for 1515, 1516, 1517. Of course, 1517 is the beginning of the Reformation. Zwingli, Erasmus, and Luther were all reformers. They all got the Greek manuscripts. That's what actually happened back here, too, with Wycliffe and Jan Hus. And both of them got persecuted. By this time, there are too many reformers to be persecuted. And of course, that's why we call it the Reformation. But Zwingli got a hold of the Greek texts. Erasmus, of course, got a, a hold of the Greek texts. That's where we got our King James translation from. And Luther, of course, got a hold of the Greek texts and was already trained in them. And that's why he posted his 95 Theses in 1517. So this is the Reformers. Reformers. This is Reformers before it was officially called the Reformation. This is Reformers when it becomes officially the Reformation. And then you got this here, and this is John Knox. And if it weren't for John Knox, there wouldn't have been a King James, because he was the tutor to King James. 
okay? And so by the time the John Knox is coming out, I mean, this is 1562 at the end of it, okay? But this is John Knox when he's first getting started. He was in Scotland. He got jailed in Scotland. Then he comes out of Scotland in 1549. He goes to England. He finds out about the Reformation that way. I mean, he knew something about it, but he really wasn't all that educated in it. After he comes to England, he finds out, oh, there's this guy named John Calvin in Geneva. So he goes and he visits Calvin, then he comes back to England. Okay, and then he goes back to Scotland. So John Knox had an awful lot to do with the English Reformation. So you see, each time this occurs, it's divisible by seven from the last time it occurs, which is divisible by seven from the first time it occurs versus parousia here. So it's being tracked, and it's synonymal. And that's how come we know who it is, because these are the major events and the major people that have to do with Bible dissemination, translation, etc. Okay? And then you have another whole curious here, and um, I forget who that is. It's right at the end, 1583. So let's do it. 1583. That could still be not. I don't. I think Knox is dead by then. Plus 30. Okay, 1613. Okay, well that's that's the King James Bible itself. Okay, that's the King James Bible coming out of product of the Reformation is because of that that um, America ends up being, you know, because America is pretty much, you know, England. And they're coming over to England in order to get away from the continent and then they go from England to America and they take a King James Bible with them. So this is the King James Bible itself and of course there were a bunch of reformers involved in that, not just one like Knox. Okay, you see how, how, how this tracks? The meaning is very consistent. Alright, so then the next time it occurs, after verse 48, okay, so here's Matthew 24, 48, which we were just looking at. Then it's Matthew 24, 50. So what's 24, 50? 24, 50 is right here. Okay. And that ends up being uh, 1607, that's 1637 A.D., 38, 39, 40, 41, 42. And what's really interesting here, and this is where we get to see in full the, the sort of satire, is this is when Charles, who was the son of James I, Charles doesn't like the Protestant way of doing things. He wants to revert it back to Catholicism. And what ends up happening here is what's called the Long Parliament, where basically, as a result of it, um, Charles ends up being deposed, okay, because he wanted to change the, 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 who, who gets to talk about Bible. He wants to change it back to the suzerainty of the, of the crown. And the England, the English weren't going to have any of that. They they said no, sorry, and they deposed him. Okay, so here's the King James Bible, which they finally got, and now everybody's got one because it's the official Bible of England. Now, it wasn't the only one, but it was the official one. And now the old, the guy who sponsored that, his own son, is deposed because he wants to undo who gets to have the Bible, who gets to rule on it, who gets to say what it says. So he gets to post. Now see, this ends up being the poster boy for the whole thing. Who is your Lord? You finally get the appearance of the Lord. See, we started that all the way back up here. Okay. All the way back up here. Here's the Lord appearing to you. Now you got Bible. Now there's an argument over what that Bible is and who gets to translate it and what they say about it. But you get it. And the reformers are all depicted here as making sure you get the Bible yourself, culminating in a dramatic appearance of the English Reformation. So here's the English Bible. 
and now some guy comes along and says, no, I'm sorry, I'm your Lord instead, and you don't get to just interpret the Bible on your own, I'm going to take it over again, and they say, no, no, no. And that's what's so interesting about this period, because this should be a 1610, meaning 1640 A.D., but the 1640s occurring instead here the end of the voting period and England is voting no we don't want you as our Lord we want our Lord and its Bible as our Lord not you and so they deposed them so time was off kilter because this should have been 1610 but now you can see why the 1610 is actually occurring here because the legal king is being deposed because he illegally wants to depose the Bible isn't that cute? So that's going to be, see, past this prologue, there's this thing called precedence. It's true in law and literature. We now have a definition of what kurios is. Who is the Lord of your life and who gets to determine who lords over you the meaning of the word that appears to you, parousia, and now it's just shortened to whole kurios. Okay, starting up here. And that's what these battles all are. The secular authority didn't like Jan Hus and didn't like Wycliffe. The secular authority did not like Zwingli and Erasmus and Luther. The secular authority did not like John Knox, although they liked him better because by then the, Revol the, the Reformation was getting ready to really occur in England. So now it's in England, and now the secular authority agrees with the Bible being in your private hands and you privately determine it on your own. So now we have a unity between secular authority and the Word. Now we have the secular authority rebelling against the Word, trying to assert that they're your Lord instead of the Lord, and they get to post. So that tells you how the rest of Matthew, starting in our time, verse 25, that's the seven, you know, have to add 30 to it, so that's 1695 plus 30. Seventeen twenty five. This is when the United States is getting started. So now we have oh, we've got a definition from the overthrow of Charles, son of James the First, now entering into modern history when it's the US involved. But we don't have the word curious appearing for a long time. Doesn't appear again until our time. So, what's the story? Well, we got the next appearance of another synonym. The Bridegroom. Which is an update on your Lord. Because now it's stressing the intimacy of that. This is the War of the Austrian Succession. And now we have the Bridegroom. And that's where I'll have to pick up next. I mean, we're going to come back to Lord. But we've got an interim additional synonym for Lord as bridegroom. What does that mean? 